alta velocità. Okay, I guess uh, we can start. Uh, let me first of all uh, thank uh, Professor Alessandro for uh, accepting the invitation, uh, as you can imagine, on very short notice. And uh, I guess the collaboration is pretty busy in these days, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, his talk. Um, so I, I don't think he needs any introduction. Everybody knows <laughs> what he's going to talk about. And uh, measurement of neutrino velocity with uh, the Opera detector. Thank you. Okay, so let me start uh, this seminar uh, thanking all of you for being there and uh, not at the beach with the beautiful sun you have outside. So uh, my goal today is uh, to go through the main point of the me measurement of the neutrino velocity with the object detector. And uh, I will try to show you that uh, it's a difficult uh, measurement and the OPERA collaboration has tried to do its best uh, to achieve uh, this measurement. So the OPERA collaboration uh, consists of uh, 13 uh, institutions in 11 countries. It's an international collabora collaboration. And furthermore, uh, we profited from the collaboration of uh, individual and group that uh, are outside the OPERA collaboration uh, for various uh, metrology measurement and geodetic measurement reported here. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, the CERN at CERN, there is the type teaming uh, team at CERN and the proton synchrotron group at CERN. Then there is the geodesy group of Rome, the Swiss Institute of Metrology and the German Institute of Metrology. <coughs> so the, princip uh, the principle of neutrino velocity measurement is uh, simple. It's uh, simply the ratio of a precisely measured baseline and a time of flight. For the time of flight measurement, you need uh, to tag the uh, proton production time, and from the proton production time, you know the neutrino production time. That's the departure of the neutrino. And then you add to tag the arrival point of the neutrino, tagging time, of course, uh, when they interact in a far detector. You need an accurate determination of the baseline. This is why we had some uh, geodesy friend with us. And uh, as uh, you expect a small effect, uh, you need a long baseline. The analysis was blind. Uh, we didn't know at all the result until uh, a few weeks ago we opened the box. And the box uh, was open after an adequate uh, understanding of the error uh, was reached. So past experimental result about this, there is a final experiment uh, which uh, measure the absolute value of uh, Wu minus C divided by C. And, uh, it, uh, and the result of this measurement is this one below this number. Then there is uh, the supernova uh, 1987. Uh, basically, uh, the electron antineutrino have been tagged to arrive at the same time as the light. And then uh, the baseline was uh, this incredible number of uh, light years. And so uh, this uh, sets this limit. And then there is a more uh, recent uh, MINOS result uh, using a muon antineutrino on a baseline which is uh, similar to the CNGS1. And they found that uh, Wu minus C divided by C is 5.1 without absolute value is 5.1 plus or minus 2.9. So it's an effect which is 1.8 sigma. This slide I can skip. This is the opera detector. As you can see from this person, it's a big detector and is also usually dirty. And out of it, uh, we have uh, to, to work. 
So uh, the, the key uh, detector is the target tracker, which is uh, used for the uh, location in space and time of the neutrino interaction. It is made of uh, excluded uh, plastic uh, scintillator strip with the uh, light uh, collection with the uh, wavelength uh, shifter fiber. And the fiber are uh, read out at each side with the photomultiplier. And um, uh, there is basically one uh, front-end duck board uh, per side. So don't be very afraid by this slide. This is basically the TT. Then the TT data are sent to a, uh, to a switch for communication with another switch, and then the TT data are processed by are processed by these two computers, and then sent again to another computer with the further uh, processing. The other important point is the GPS clock. The antenna is outside. Uh, the underground laboratory, and then there is a cable that goes inside the laboratory up to this uh, PC clock. So uh, the, the main readout board are in green in this uh, picture. Uh, they are called the mezzanine duck card. They are common to all Opera subdetector. Uh, you can think about them as a CPU with an embedded uh, Linux operating system. They have uh, each board has its own memory. There is an FPGA uh, that uh, do the time tag. Uh, there is a clock receiver to uh, get an accurate time tag and the internet board for the communication. Uh, this is the time that comes in with the GPS antenna. It goes in the Opera master clock and it's uh, distributed over optical fiber to all the boards. Uh, the, uh, the event we study are uh, charged current interaction, where there is an interaction of a neutrino, there is a muon that cross the detector. Uh, there is a neutral current interaction, where there is a, a neutrino that stays a neutrino, and we see some little activity in the target. And then we study also muon that came from the rock, which is uh, before the detector, and so there is a muon track that cross all the, all the detector. As I told you, uh, this is CERN. They shoot the neutrino that uh, travel underground up to the LNGS. This is the LNGS lab, which is underneath the Grand Sasso mountain. It is not uh, this place, but really underneath. And there is uh, that high of rock, and uh, this is opera. So how do you produce a neutrino beam? You fire uh, some proton from the SPS at 400 GeV on a target. And then, um, and then uh, this uh, proton extraction uh, occurs uh, twice. Uh, and uh, it has a length of uh, 10.5 microse uh, microseconds. And uh, the two extractions are separated by 50 milliseconds. Uh, basically, there is a kicker magnet which uh, ramps up. And when the magnetic field goes up, it pulls down the proton from the SPS. And then the proton, they go on the target. And as a final product, you got a neutrino. Uh, this is the beam intensity, 2.4, 10 to the 13. And uh, we have a, an almost average pure neutrino, neutrino muon beam of 17 GV, which is uh, traveling uh, through the Earth. So this is the production point, this is the detection point, this is the uh, baseline. In order uh, to select, uh, in order to select uh, interaction uh, that occur in opera in coincidence with a neutrino shot, we measure the time in opera and we subtract to this time the time of the kicker magnet plus the time of light computed at the speed of C. And then we require that in absolute value it is below 20 microseconds. Uh, this is a very safe requirement, and for this, uh, that uh, can uh, be reached uh, with the standard uh, GPS system, which have a resolution of uh, 100 nanoseconds, uh, but uh, this is inadequate uh, for what we want to do. So these are the two extractions I told you about, 15 milliseconds apart. And if you zoom in an extraction, you see that the length is indeed 10.5 microseconds. And this is really measured with the ZOOS data, with the Opera data. Basically, I told you that the proton uh, 
uh, there is a signal to the kicker magnet and then the proton came out. This is basically what you see, that the proton are coming out of the SPS after the kicker magnet signal, which is set at zero. And so this uh, proton time distribution is closely linked to the neutrino time distribution, uh, which uh, give us the departure time of the neutrino. Yes? You were talking about how to, I did not really follow completely, you were talking about how to be precise about the distance, is that, is that what the previous slide was? Yes, the previous slide. The previous one. Yes. This is the distance, but I will tell you more accurately about the geodesy measurement. I will show you some more material about the geodesy measurement. So this is basically, this is, this is the, the, the time distribution of the proton as they come out from the SPS and they are sent toward the CNGS for extraction one and extraction two. And so you see that uh, the distribution is not flat and it is different for extraction one and extraction two. So in order to do, so what you want to do uh, crude, you can average this distribution, but this is a bit stupid because nowadays we can reach 10 nanoseconds time resolution, so we can resolve the individual beam. And so this is what we have decided to do, to do a precise measurement of the proton spill. So to do a precise measurement, a, pre a precise time measurement, you need to have a precise clock. And so initially we thought we could use uh, the GPS clock at LNGS, and so we compare uh, the clock, the GPS clock with the cesium clock for clock one, and you see it's a complete disaster. You have a deviation of, uh, uh, of a large quantity, much larger than the resolution we would like to have. And so we thought that maybe clock one is broken. We try clock two, and uh, it's the same behavior. So we need uh, to resynchronize basically the clock. And to do this business, we have been in touch with the CERN timing team since uh, 2003. And in 2008, uh, we did a major upgrade of the timing system, uh, both in CERN and in LNGS. So the opera sensitivity is driven by the following facts. We have high neutrino energy, so a large cross-section and then high statistics. And this is the number of events we can analyze. We have a sophisticated timing system with one nanosecond uh, CNGS opera synchronization. Uh, we try to reach an accurate calibration of all the intermediate step, and we did uh, a precise measurement of the proton time distribution and hence of the neutrino time distribution. And then we did also a precise measurement of the global uh, geodesy, I will uh, talk to you later. And then at the end, 10 nanoseconds is the overall accuracy uh, taking into account statistical and systematic error. So I, told you, so I will uh, try to uh, explain this picture a bit uh, schematically because um, there are some high level of technology which is involved there, which we borrow from external uh, people. So here uh, you have the two GPS that gave uh, this uh, strange uh, trouble uh, that, uh, that uh, the, they, they shift in time and they drift in time. So in order to synchronize them, we, have using, we are using those tools which are called the Polar X that look to the same satellite which is sending pulse to the Polar X which is in LNGS and to the Polar X which is at CERN. And so in that way, we manage to keep uh, the two clock synchronous, and basically every second we do a correction to this clock on the LNGS side, and on that side every second we do a correction to the clock on the CERN side. So you see the Polar X device, they need a cesium clock as an input. Uh, they are tagging the one pulse per second with respect to the individual satellite observation. And then uh, those uh, very smart people uh, from the timing system, they told us that uh, when you use a satellite and you look at it from two different sides, there can be different paths in the ionosphere, so this can introduce some uh, uh, miscalibration of the time signal. And so we are, uh, uh, on their advice, we, have, we are using this uh, so-called ionosphere-free correction uh, P3 code. 
which is a standard technique for high accuracy time transfer. This is, this, these are the two devices at CERN and LNGS. This is what a cesium clock looks like, if you have never seen one before. So GPS, the standard operation of the GPS, uh, for example, when you're driving your car, is that it can resolve the X, the Y, the Z, and the time if you see at least four different satellites. But uh, what uh, we are uh, using is the so-called common view mode. We use the same satellite for the, two side, uh, for the two sides, and we do a comparison. Basically, X, Y, and Z are known from other measurement, and we can determine the time difference of the local clock with respect uh, to the satellite by the so-called mechanism of the offline data exchange. Uh, what is nice also is that uh, the baseline is uh, very short to the path uh, uh, of the signal through the satellite and back, and this uh, allows uh, this method to work rather well. So these are uh, the oscillations. Uh, I mentioned you above, but now they are measured accurately, and we can cancel them on both the CNGS and on the CERN site. And so we have a very good clock. Okay, then uh, this was done by the Swiss. Then we thought it's a good idea to let, uh, to let uh, the German check what the Swiss did. And so we asked to, the, uh, to an independent uh, uh, bureau in Germany, which measure time very accurately. So they told us, uh, yes, uh, we can do it with this device. So they came at LNGS and took some data. And then with the same device, they went at CERN and they took some data. So if the Swiss did no mistake at all, they should, be, they should have found a straight line. Instead, there is a small gap, which is 2.3 nanosecond with this error. And this is, what, uh, this is within the error uh, claimed by the Swiss team. So there is nothing strange. I mean, it appeared that the time cross calibration is accurate. And uh, anyway, we took uh, this uh, correction into account. Then concerning the proton timing, uh, to see the time the proton leaves uh, the CNGS beam, we are using a so-called beam current transformer. And then the signal of the beam current transformer is uh, digitized with uh, a waveform digitizer. Both the waveform digitizer and the beam current transformer are uh, triggered by the kicker signal uh, of the magnet that shoots out uh, the proton. And then there is a UTC timestamp on the waveform. So this slide is uh, not so nice. Uh, this one is nicer. This is a typical waveform. So here you see five peaks, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this, uh, five, uh, this magic five number is what you expect from the structure of the beam in the proton synchrotron. Then the beam is taken out of the proton synchrotron, is put in the SPS, the super proton synchrotron, where there is a radio frequency at 200 megahertz. So if you zoom the beam structure, then you see that the, with the BCT, we clearly resolve the five uh, nanosecond within the peak of the proton. And so we are able to see the 200 megahertz of the SPS radio frequency. So this is a check that what we see in the, B, in the, in the BCT is consistent with what we expect. So uh, each, for each event we measure, we know its proton spill but clearly, we don't know the parent proton, if the proton that interacts is the one which is rather late or the one which is rather early. So what we do is, the, is we normalize, is we sum the waveform and we normalize them. And so we got the predicted time distribution of the proton event, which is very similar to the predicted uh, time distribution of the neutrino event. And then we compare this predicted time with the time we measure in opera. And this comparison is legitimate because the two clocks are very well synchronized. So there, there, are, there is no offset we should uh, carry about. 
then you can tell me uh, clearly there can be a problem because you don't know the neutrino production point in the decay tunnel. Uh, but, uh, for example, you can, uh, sorry, you can also uh, see this with some analytical argument where, where you tell that uh, the particle that propagates is a parent meson uh, and uh, you compare it uh, to a particle that travel at the speed of light and then the delta t due to the different uh, z position uh, is uh, like z over c square and then there is this gamma square. So basically from uh, this sort of argument it's a small effect. Then we also did a full uh, fluke simulation of, uh, of uh, all uh, the propagation of the parent in the beam uh, in the decay tunnel. And then the difference, um, assuming the speed of light or from the full simulation is a tiny effect. So basically uh, the principle is the following. With the BCT, uh, you have a measurement of the uh, neutrino departure time, then the neutrino day travel, and then you measure in opera the neutrino arrival time. So the obvious relation between the departure, the departure time and the arrival time is the time offset they take to travel. Coming back uh, to geodesy, uh, you have to know that uh, I, I told you that the laboratory is inside the mountain. So it is not possible to see any satellite inside the mountain. Uh, so um, basically two uh, benchmarks uh, were uh, carefully measured at each side of the tunnel. And then uh, with some prism and some optic measurement, the position was, uh, was measured coming inside the tunnel and then finally inside the experiment. And this is uh, the limiting resolution is due to this uh, swim of the GPS position from the exit of the highway tunnel uh, uh, up to the laboratory. So uh, there have been a campaign of CERN and LNGS measurement performing different period of time. And those uh, different measurements are uh, combined in a framework uh, which is called uh, ATRF 2000, uh, which account uh, for Earth uh, dynamic effects. And so uh, those are uh, the benchmark, and they are uh, very well measured, and they are at different positions. So you don't, uh, you don't have to imagine that those are, are the same point. Uh, those, those one are two different points on one side of the tunnel, and those one are two different points on the other side of the tunnel. And then we cross-check everything again in June 2011. And so the resulting uh, distance is this one with an error of 20 centimeter. So can you trust this device? So these are the, uh, are the measurements that have been performed in a time period of uh, two years of the up, east, and north position. And so what you see here is the small drift of the Italy toward east and the small drift of Italy towards north. And then, as you may know, there has, there has been an earthquake in 2009 in that region of Italy. And so this uh, shifted the, the whole uh, place by one centimeter and moved it uh, to north and to east in, uh, in zero time, basically, uh, by by, by eight centimeter. So we are really sensitive uh, to small uh, effects. Then uh, there is also uh, something about uh, the time calibration technique, uh, which uh, I will be very fast. Uh, for example, the, tr the trick we can use as, as experimentalist uh, is to measure the time difference, TA minus TB, and then we can measure the time sum, TA plus TB, and then you have two systems in, in two equations and two unknown, and you can measure both the TA and TB. And in that way, taking the difference, there are some systematic effects that cancel out. So you have to do the work twice, but you are more accurate. Then there is uh, another important topic, which is the BCT calibration. Uh, this is the device that sees the proton. 
So uh, we did, uh, in order to achieve the best uh, resolution, we did a dedicated uh, beam experiment using uh, the LHC beam. Uh, maybe LHC was waiting uh, while we were doing this measurement, but for us, this was an important measurement. And at the end, uh, the delay of the BCT uh, is uh, that number, which is uh, known with uh, uh, that precision. And so, uh, just, uh, so to measure, uh, to, to find uh, this delay, we have been using uh, two other uh, devices, uh, which were measuring the time T1, T2. Then uh, T3 was derived from T1 and T2, and then this uh, gave us uh, the delay, uh, which, was, uh, which is essentially uh, T3 minus T4, which is measured by the waveform digitizer. So just uh, to uh, let you know what's going on here, if you count, so I told you there are 12 bunches uh, spaced by uh, 15 uh, nanoseconds. So if you count the blue stuff, there are 12. And so you see they are all shifted in time because the position of this device along the proton line is different. But then if you zoom and you adjust for the different delay, you get that the peaks, uh, they overlap almost uh, perfectly. So this is how we are confident uh, that we know the BCT calibration. So uh, to summarize uh, quickly, uh, this is uh, the SPS. The kicker signal sends the proton out. The kicker signal is recorded, uh, is used also by the waveform digitizer and by the BCT. And here you have the delay of the different element. And this is the departure time of the neutrino. Then uh, there is the flight from the BCT to the target, which you can correct for. And then at the LNGS, this is the detector. This is the detector. There is a path inside the detector. Then it goes to the photomultiplier and to the front-end electronic. So, uh, so you have an indetermination due to the position of the heat in the fiber. So the wall delay is 59, but most of this delay is due to a fixed amount, which is given by the PMT and the front end board. So the contribution, which has an indetermination, is rather small. And then the signal goes to the FPGA, which does the timestamp, and it also takes 25 nanoseconds to the FPGA to do the timestamp. And, and then you have the, the precise clock that is sent uh, to the Opera Master clock for the clock correction. In order to do an accurate measurement of the TT time response, we have used this picoseconds injection laser from which we measure the delay from the photocathode to the FPGA input. And then there is, there is this average, okay, and this is the average time response that I told you before. And then uh, this error shown, shown here takes into account the position in the termination, the pulse site dependence, uh, the random walk inside the electronic, and some other uh, duck effect that are accounted using the simulation. So this is the delay in the various uh, calibration. In the, the, this is the delay due to the various element. I don't want you to read the number. But please uh, try to observe that whenever possible, the delay was measured using two different methods. So in order to try to spot as much as possible any problem. This is a, a comparison of the uh, time difference uh, after all correction. And so basically, there is no time difference at all. It's uh, well within uh, one uh, nanosecond, a half nanosecond even. So uh, the event selection, uh, the stop in the detector is the, uh, it, the time stamp of the earliest hit in the target tracker. We use uh, that many pot and we select the internal event which are produced inside the target, that many. And we also use external events which are produced by interaction in the rock. And to have a more, uh, 
to be more sure, uh, we, we require that there is a three-dimensional muon track in the detector, and we have that many event. So if the event is produced inside the detector, then you know the production point, and you know precisely the timing. If the event is produced outside the detector, you simply see a particle that uh, comes inside the detector from the outside, but you don't really know the production point. And so there can be an indetermination uh, due to the poor knowledge of the production point. But uh, this is more or less similar to what I told you about, uh, before uh, concerning the time of the decay inside the decay tunnel. You can easily uh, show that uh, doing some arithmetics, uh, this has a tiny effect. And to cross-check this arithmetics, uh, we use a full Monte Carlo simulation, and we see that the two samples differ by a two nanosecond uh, systematic uncertainty. There is one final correction uh, you have to take into account. The, uh, the end of the baseline is defined more or less in the middle of the detector. So if the first heat appears towards the end of the detector, you have to drift it back to the origin, or if the first heat occurs at the beginning of the detector, you have to drift it back again. Uh, the detector is at most 140 centimeters, and so this correction. Uh, it can be done, and it is not big. So let me try, uh, let me show you first this slide. So this is the arrival time of the event with the crosses in opera, the first extraction and the second extraction. Then there is the departure time uh, computed with the BCT, and so we want that the departure time is equal to the arrival time plus the time of flight. So we are basically looking for the delta T by which those two distributions overlap. And the fundamental reason we can do this is that because we have a very precise time intercalibration and CERN and at the LNGS. So in order to do this, uh, we don't use uh, this uh, bin the distribution, but we do an unbin the likelihood fit, and uh, we try to find uh, this value delta T. So a positive or negative delta T means that the neutrino arrive earlier or later than the light, and the statistical error is evaluated from those uh, log likelihood curves. The analysis was conducted uh, deliberately as a blind analysis, uh, using, for example, the wrong baseline, referring uh, to some wrong magnet element, ignoring the accurate uh, geodesy, ignoring all the detail about uh, the TT and the DAC uh, time response, ignoring uh, the GPS intercalibration, ignoring uh, the BCT delays, and ignoring the OTC calibration. This clearly because we didn't want to know the result on the neutrino velocity while we were doing the measurement. And so the resulting delta T is a huge number uh, to which uh, a lot of delay have to be taken out to extract the physical delta T. Though, so this is uh, the measured delta T, which has a lot of physical delay. Uh, if you use this delta T, uh, you see that the chi-square divided by the number of degree of freedom is uh, 1.06 uh, for the first extraction and 1.12 for the second extraction. So there is nothing wrong from a statistical analysis. This is uh, the, for the first extraction, this is the rising edge and the tail. For the second extraction, this is the rising edge and the tail of the flat signal. Basically, it's a zoom here, 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 and here. So there seems to be nothing horribly wrong. Then some analysis cross-check. Uh, we have uh, computed the delta T for the first extraction and the second extraction using 2009, 2010, and 2011, and we see no time dependence. We also uh, computed the delta T using data uh, taken during the day minus, uh, take, uh, minus uh, data taken during the night. 
and the difference in the delta T is zero. Then in order uh, to look for some uh, thermal effect, uh, we try to compute spring plus fall, where the temperature is usually below, uh, lower, and minus the summer, where it is uh, rather hot. And again, the difference is zero. Uh, then we have used uh, all events, internal plus external, only internal event, and the number is the same, only the statistical error is larger uh, because you have less statistic. This is a list uh, of all the correction and the error on all the correction, but okay, we don't have time. I mean, I don't think it is worth to look at all of them. It's a complicated measurement with uh, several correction to it. And this is uh, the final result we got uh, when we opened the box. So the delta T is not zero and it is positive. This is what we measure. Then if we want to go from delta T to a relative uh, difference of the neutrino velocity with respect to T, uh, this is clearly connected to delta T through this uh, formula, and uh, this is our final result. So uh, looking into those evaluation of statistical and systematic error, it is uh, different from zero by uh, six uh, sigma. Then we also try to look uh, to the energy dependence. Uh, so on, uh, only for internal uh, muon neutrino charged current event, we can measure the total energy, which is the sum of the energy of the muon and of the hadronic energy. And uh, we, we check in the, from the Monte Carlo simulation uh, that if we cut, uh, if we select event at low energy and event at uh, high energy, the response of the detector is the same. So uh, for those events uh, with, uh, with which are fully contained in the detector, this is the delta T, and it is measured at this average neutrino energy. And then uh, we divided the data in two bins such that there is the same amount of statistic here and there, and this is what we get. So with the current, uh, with the current uh, statistic, uh, there is uh, no sensitivity to an energy dependence of this measurement. So this brings me uh, to my conclusion. So I show you that uh, the Opera detector at uh, the LNGS has measured uh, the, neutrino, um, the neutrino velocity with the most uh, sensitive uh, uh, measurement both of space and time. The measurement profit from the largest statistics accumulated uh, uh, by OPERA. Uh, then there is also a dedicated upgrade of the timing system and an accurate uh, uh, measurement of the distance. Uh, the analysis is using uh, data from 2009, 2010, and also 2011, which is this year. And uh, these have been used uh, uh, to measure uh, the, the delta T and this is the measurement with delta T. So we are not able to observe the, uh, uh, we are not able to explain the observed effect in terms of unknown systematic uncertainty. Therefore, the measurement indicate a neutrino velocity which is higher than the speed of light, and this is the result. The possible delta T energy dependence has also been investigated, but uh, it, cannot be, uh, it cannot be worked out with the current uh, statistical accuracy. So despite the, the large significance of the measurement reported here and the stability of the analysis as a function of time, we are aware that the potentially great impact of the result motivates the continuation of our study in order to identify any still unknown systematic effect or uh, to further improve the measurement. And uh, at uh, this stage, uh, we do not attempt uh, any theoretical or phenomenological interpretation of uh, this result.
Can you tell us about uh, similar experiments like K2K or so? Do they have uh, other experiments like K K2K or? Okay. So uh, what I know, what I more or less know, kind of rumors, is that Minos will be able uh, to update this measurement. is really at the beginning. So Minos will be able to update this measurement on a rather time, short time scale, about four to six months. Probably they are, they, probably my, my guess is that they will be able to reanalyze their old data with a more sophisticated analysis technique. And in that way, they hope to be able to improve this error. And so this would be a fast way to have a confirmation of our result. If not, they will have to upgrade their hardware, take some more data for several months, analyze the data, and work out a new result. And in parallel, I also heard a rumor that also in Japan at T2K, they are, I have been told that they are already ordered some device that are needed for a very precise time measurement. And so it looks also that in T2K, uh, okay, they will have to install the, this device, uh, learn how to use them, take the data and analyze the data. So uh, maybe this will take some more time, but uh, on a year time scale, maybe there will be two different measurements completely independent from the one at CERN, one MINOS and one in T2K. Because for example, what I can tell you right away uh, is that imagine that you you turn the CNGS beam and you do an experiment somewhere else in Europe. But as one end of the chain is the same for Opera and for the, this hypothetical new experiment, you cannot exclude that uh, there is something which is not presently understood at, at, at CERN. So the best cost check would be to do the experiment in a completely different uh, uh, framework. So from your side, you think that there's not much to be done? To the best of our understanding, we don't find any obvious bug in what we did. We will continue to, to investigate. There are more checks that we can do, but as I told you before, those checks will not solve 100% the problem. So it's better for us that we come out with the result with some caution so that the other experiment can start right away a new campaign of measurement. Thank you. You uh, checked for <coughs> season of the year and for uh, day-night effects. Did you check for effects associated with the phase of the moon? Uh, some, some rough estimate has been done, and it doesn't appear uh, there can be effect so large that, uh, that can explain uh, the delta T we measure. But uh, when, when we come, uh, I mean, since we come out to the community with the last, uh, last Friday with this result, we have uh, received several suggestions to look for effect of those kind, and we will certainly consider uh, this, uh, this, uh, this suggestion more carefully to check uh, that uh, there, are, there have no major implication in our result. Also, we have been, uh, yes, I mean, also we have been uh, thought, uh, asked about if we consider some possible deformation of, of the Earth of some different origin, but uh, this is underway. Yes, so what about the uh, computational numerical errors? I mean, I'm sure you've, you know, considered them, but for example, in the Monte Carlo simulation, there's uh, quite complicated errors in some kind of random number generating okay. and I mean there's this this particular measurement let me point out very quickly if I find the slide so this line this red line it appears continuous but it's not a Monte Carlo 
It's the measurement of the proton timing structure we got with the device we call BCT. And this, uh, this curve with the error bar is the opera data. So in this plot, there is no Monte Carlo. We That's use the Monte Carlo only as a cross-check of several small details of the analysis. But it doesn't play a key role, I would say, in the extraction of delta T. And what about computations in general? I mean, if you repeat computations, the problem of working with very small numbers and the actual hardware of the processors of the computers. What, I can, uh, what I can tell you, we did, uh, we did this trick. We took uh, the data out of the BCT, okay? And then we shifted them by some amount and we analyzed them as if they were real opera data, just to, just to check that there are no numerical uh, uh, problem in the procedure. And if we shift them by a certain amount, then doing the, doing the analysis, we are able to see the same amount. So this, we, we have done some, some checks of this kind. For example, we have done a shift. We have, we have simulated 100 experiments like opera, and repeated the analysis, done another shift, 100 experiments, repeated the analysis, and every time we have found back consistently the result we were starting with. Was, uh, was there any sign of neutrino oscillations and uh, does affect the measurement or not? Neutrino oscillation, uh, I mean, what do you mean by neutrino oscillation? I mean, clearly we reported that we have observed neutrino oscillation of nu 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 tau. So clearly uh, it appears that we have oscillation in our data. But, uh, but uh, I don't know how can this uh, influence the, the velocity measurement. We will have to think about this, yes. Did you correlate the Muon uh, probability the, uh, function. Of the, the, in, instead of the proton time distribution, the Muon time distribution with the detected neutrino, the question is because if you think uh, that there is an uh, amplification of the neutrino when passed by the tunnel, by the decay tunnel, it, uh, it seems it, it, uh, it happened that uh, when you have a laser that passed by a uh, a plasma that amplify it, the peaks are uh, shifted. Hmm. They no, are no, but shifted. your yes. suggestion is a good suggestion. We have already been asked to do this, and we will do it. So we can use also, instead of relying uh, on the BCT measurement, There are those muon counters, and the, the VCT is uh, somewhere here. And yes. so we measure the timing of the proton with the time of the VCT. We can also, and, and hence we say that the time of the neutrino is the time of the proton. But we could also measure the time of the neutrino using the time of the muon that cross okay. those muon detector. And this, we, will, we also would like to do this. Yes because uh, you don't know exactly where the decay is produced in the tunnel. And if there is an, uh, a shift, if you see the decay backward in time, uh, so you see uh, instead of uh, the emission of a neutrino and a muon, the decay of a muon into, with a neutrino, like an atom, and the emission of, uh, in backward in time of the meson, and so you have, you have an analog to a laser amplifier. A, a short pulse laser, laser amplifier. And in, in this case, uh, when you have a, a short pulse through an a amplifier a plasma, that in, in this case will be the muons, uh, then you have a, a shift, a shift in the time. Uh, so the, the next emission 
of the of the neutrino will be not in the same place as the first one, and they will be shifting, so the time uh, of arriving is earlier. Mm -hmm. no, for example, concerning the unknown decay point, uh, we did a full Monte Carlo simulation, and we found that, that the effect uh, is uh, very, very small with respect to the delta T we measure, but uh, the check with the muon, we can surely do it. If I remember correctly, you said that uh, you do not see a difference if you divide your data into charge current and neutral current. No, what I told you is that there is no difference if I use... Uh, sorry, let me do that way. No, sorry. Previous slide. So those are those are a charged current event at low energy and those are a charged current event at high energy. And there is no time dependence. This is what they show here. But for the measurement of the time difference, yes. you have used uh, both charged current yes. and neutral current. Yes. But do you see a difference in the two categories of events? Uh, you have measured a time difference. I, I don't know if this 60 has been nanoseconds. Checked. I don't know if it has been checked. Do you expect any time difference? I'm just asking. No, I, I don't know but, if it has uh, been measured. In particular, in the case of charge current, the timing of the events is given by the detection of the muon. Yes. And uh, typically, what is the delay of the signal with respect to the appearance of the muon? I, I don't remember which detector signal. you use. To detect the muons. I mean, uh, the, the gra no, no, we are using the scintillator. We are using the scintillator. So the muon is detected very close to, to the place where it is produced. So that delay you mentioned is, uh, is negligible, is really tiny. Let me. Well, it try is at least the delay of the photomultiplier and the base. Yes, so it's yes, something of the order of 50, yes, 60 nanoseconds, maybe but more. For a, for a neutral current event, it will be the same because there will be a secondary hadron that will produce, uh, that will produce a particle that will be seen by the PMT. So, and, and in any case, the, the PMT signal, you see, we use the PMT signal that are close to the vertex. So we are not using that signal for the muon, but the signal which is close to the vertex, to the production vertex, and for the neutral current events is the same. So the timing is not coming from the muon, but in both cases, yes. for both categories of events, it's coming from the hadrons. Yes. Yes. But you have multi-anode PMs or what? Sorry? Which kind of photomultipliers you have? This one. Multi-anodes, I suppose. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the delay is not that is not small. Okay, no, thanks. So I have two questions. One question is how many neutrino events do you have per one pulse, one ten millisecond pulse? Well, I mean, we need to have many pulses. Less to than have one. one. Okay. <laughs> Less Good. than one. For now sure. the second question is, of course, all these pulses are not identical. What is the spread in their uh, duration? I mean, the starting point... millisecond plus or minus? No, no, I mean, no. The starting point is precise because it is given... No, the width. The, I'm asking about the width. But the width, we measure it. I mean, it's, it's what we measure. No, spread. I'm asking about spread from one pulse to another.
So All right. this, this is your typical pulse. This no? distribution right. is a summed over all the data. Right. What I'm asking is summed. what is the, the distribution of, pulse, uh, of uh, time widths of pulses? Uh, I don't know, but what I know is that it doesn't matter for our measurement. Oh, it does. Because we sum them up yeah, and but you then sum, we you compare sum different to the pulses. data. But you sum different pulses. How do you sum different pulses? They, they have different duration, right? So how but do you the sum start, them up? The start is always given by the, the start is always given by the kicker magnet. Right. How about and the then, end? How about the end? And then we, we sample it for a long time, which is longer than the pulse itself. Now I'm asking, when you draw this figure, you sum over all pulses. You sum your data yes. over all the pulses. Yes. Now the pulses are, are all different. Yes. So which pulse do you compare with? With an the average pulse by, for which we got a neutrino event detected in opera. We have a neutrino event detected in opera. We, do, we have the, the, the pulse of the proton of the first and of the second extraction. And we use that pulse. Well, uh, I guess, um, first of all, I want to uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. It's very interesting. And uh, I understand it's a very exciting time for, for you personally, for many other also. people, I can imagine. A um, couple questions I have. Uh, my concern would be uh, timing and synchronization, clock synchronization, because uh, having um, usually uh, timing experiments are done by uh, using two permanently installed clocks in two different ends of the experiment. And in our case here, we have cesium clocks, I understand, and uh, you have GPS synchronization using same beam synchronization, pretty much. Uh, same beam would be prone to a, a sort of plate rotation, so there will be some errors due to plate rotation because it's not very precise. So I'd like you to revisit that at some point and maybe using a different technique to synchronize uh, clocks on different ends. And the second suggestion is... But um, this is the residual time difference which we see. Right. Uh, still, there will be some, uh, some effects that would be coming into this measurement due to uh, rotation, uh, uh, local plate rotation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, second suggestion is, uh, have you looked at the local uh, gravity change? Local? Local gravity change. For example, Grace mission uh, produced a high-resolution 